Hello, everyone. I am Darla Shaw. Now, usually I come on and I tell a story in first person of famous strong women in Ridgefield. But today, I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to tell you the story of Jacqueline Seligman, the crazy cat lady of Barrick Hill and Old West Mountain Road. Now, the reason I'm doing it just storytelling fashion is because I actually knew her. Oh, not well. She was a real mystery, but I did know her. So first, I'm going to tell you about my relationship with her, and then I'm going to go on and tell you the rest of the story. Well, back in 1966, I moved to Barrick Hill. I lived way up on Barrick Hill near the New York border. It was a dirt road all the way up there. Now, down below, about a third of the way up, there was the lady's house, the cat lady's house. And a little off to the side was her West Mountain house as well. Well, when I first moved here, I worked at East Ridge Middle School as a teacher. And about 3.30 to 4.30 every evening, I would come home from work. And lo and behold, I would see this elderly lady, 60, 70 years old, look sort of homeless with this red kid's wagon. And it was full of cat food. And you could see she had been struggling with it. Now, what she had been doing was going to the AMP in town. Now, the AMP at that time was where Walgreens was now, and that's where she would buy her food and her cat food and water for the cats. She would put it in the red wagon, and she would come up North Salem Road, and then she would come up Barrick Hill. So I would see her struggling and being a kind hearted person, I would stop my station wagon. We didn't have vans at that time. And I would ask her if she would like a lift and she would nod. Yes, she never really talked to me. And I would take the wagon and all of the food and put it in the back of my car. She would get into the front seat, she would sort of nod to me, and she would point where she wanted to go. She didn't talk, but I had no trouble. I did all of the talking. Well, my first day of Barrick Hill with her, I will never, ever, ever forget. So I was going to drop her off at where I knew she lived in Barrick Hill Road, but instead she pointed up and to the left. So I went up and to the left and into this driveway that she pointed to. And oh, my God, I will never, ever, ever forget this. Now you see a picture of the house that is there now that is not the house that was there, but there was land and it was a nice house. But going up this driveway, cats, it seemed like hundreds of cats were bombarding the car. They were on the roof, they were on the fenders, they were on the hood. They were everywhere looking in the windows, clawing, meowing, waiting to get fed. The cat lady would calmly get out, go to these big troughs, put in the cat food, go to big kettles that were filled up with rainwater and her water and give them water as well. She would talk to them in French and off she would go. And then she would point back to Barrick Hill. She would point to her driveway. We would drive in. Oh, my goodness, it was a replay of Old West Mountain Road. And now you see the house that is there next to Levy Park today. That's where she lived. At the time she lived there, it was a little cottage, maybe two rooms. There were Oh, shingles off the roofs. There was broken windows. It needed painting. The lawn was never mowed or kept. 
some of the neighborhood kids. They looked into the windows. They saw grass growing through the floor. They didn't think anyone lived there, but she did. And there was moss or green stuff on the walls. At least this is what she said. But that's where I left her off. Well, for, oh, I'd say five or six years, whenever I saw her, I would pick her up. As I said, she never spoke, but one Christmas, my husband and I came home and on the back porch, there was a lovely cheese tray from the AMP, and it had a little note. It said, merci, and there was a cat paw. So she obviously had found out where I did live. Well, I didn't see her for quite a while. And then I read about her in the Ridgefield Press obituary. She was Jacqueline Seligman. She was an extremely wealthy woman from Paris. Her father was an amazingly well-known art critic who would have known. And then later than that, I found out that they had come to collect all the cats. Some had burned in the first fire from the first house, but there were still hundreds of cats and people had to come in cages and take them away. Someone had to care for them, feed them. They were used to being fed and they did not want them to reproduce. But now for the rest of the story. Jacqueline Seligman was born in 1906 in Paris, France. As I said, her father was an extremely wealthy art critic, art consultant, art connoisseur, and gallery owner. He had galleries in Paris on Fifth Avenue in New York City. Oh, his clientele, the Rothschilds, the Sassoon's, the Stroganoff's, the Hearst, J.P. Morgan, the Vanderbilt's, the B. Altman's, and many of the museums use them as their art consultant. She also had a very well-known mother, Ella. Unfortunately, her father died when she was just a teenager. She had two brothers that were quite a bit older than her. There was Germaine and there was Francois. Germaine was the apple of everyone's eye. He had been in the war, highly decorated military hero. When the father died, he took over the business, very successful in both Paris and also in New York City. Well, Jacqueline did very well as a youth as well. The family had money, they had sports cars. Oh, she loved to drive. She loved to drive fast. She loved to be in her cars. And she made it on to the French racing circuit for women, which was very, very well known time. She had quite a following. It is here that she met Edme Chappelle. This is the woman who became her lover and her lifetime companion. They were both buried together in Fairlawn Cemetery. Well, also Jacqueline wrote a book that was very well known about her life on the racing circuit. Now, Ed Me was also a writer, so she helped her with the writing, and the two of them also wrote numerous periodical and newspaper articles about life on the racing circuit. Jacqueline was not only a race car driver, she was also a very proficient photographer. Her pictures were in galleries at auctions. She had her own studio. Oh, she did not like to do portraits. She liked candid pictures of interesting people and situations and events. She also worked 
along with various newspapers and war groups, so that she was working behind the lines, taking photographs that could be used in war crimes and in strategic planning for the Allies. She also was an expert bridge player. And when she first came to Ridgefield, Carl Nash was one of her bridge part. Well, in 1940, things changed. In 1940, her mother died. The brothers decided, let's give the estate and let her, Jacqueline, administer the estate. There was a lot of money, but there was artwork, silk screens, oriental painting sculpture, antiques, and one painting back then worth half a million dollars. Jacqueline was happy to do this, but then the war came. No more racing circuit. But the government asked the 25 women on the circuit to help out. Her and Ed Me did. They were going to be transported. People. They were going to drive these huge vans through the mountains, through enemy lines to help the children escape, to bring materials and goods and weaponry. They needed brave, courageous women. And both of these women were that. Well, one of the last runs right before the Germans attack Paris, the two women were in their vans and they got information. Do not come back, go right to Lisbon, Portugal, goes 300 miles. Something is going to take part in the city. Get these children to safety. And they did. They had nothing with them but their dogs, a wirehead terrier and a schnauzer. And Jacqueline, had 6,000 negatives that could be used by the Allies with her. When the two women got to Lisbon, they made a decision. They had contacts in New York. They had family. They had business. They were going to go to New York, and this is what they did. They came to New York City. They got an apartment. Edme became an editor at a publishing house. Jacqueline started a photographic studio. And they still helped bring refugee children together with their families. They were committed to the welfare of others. They also decided they needed a country house. Well, you know, in the 1900s, when someone needed a country house, they would come to Ridgefield. And that's when they bought the house on Old West Mountain Road. And supposedly that is where many of the mother's paintings and antiques and artwork and silk screen and sculpture were. Well, in 1950, things began to change for Jacqueline. Her beloved Edme past. And she was never the same after that. She seemed to lose it. She didn't have a sense of self. She became very paranoid and delusional. The brothers were concerned about what had happened to the mother's estate. So they asked for an accountant. Jacqueline couldn't give it to them. Where had all the money gone? She said, there were detectives, there were spies, there were evil people out to get her. There was fraud. There was forgery. There was embezzlement. She could not account for what had happened to the mother's goods as well. What about that half million dollar painting and all the artwork? Again, these evil people had absconded with it over the years. Yes. Things were not good for her at all. Well, at this point, the IRS was also very, very concerned because she had not been paying taxes. She said she didn't have to. She had lost so much money. She had lost millions of dollars. So how could she be expected 
to pay taxes. The IRS also found she had so many social security numbers, so many different accounts for estates and foundations and businesses and trusts and so many passports even, other than France and the United States. Jacqueline loved John F. Kennedy. She knew that he could help her out. She wrote him lengthy letters telling of, him, of the horrors of her life, how she was being sabotaged by the government, by the IRS, and by her own family, and how she needed his help. She knew he would understand. She wrote to him a number of times. He never responded directly, but Peter Salinger, did talk to her, wrote to her, and said, what you're sending us is not going to help us. You need to send us different documentation. What did she write to Kennedy about? She wrote that she was being entirely scrutinized. She could not go outside of her house. There were people in the bushes. There were cameras on the telephone poles, that there was a body double that was sent to town so that people would think she was out and about. She could not get repairs or take care of the house because as soon as somebody came into the yard, they would be kidnapped, they would be taken away. She had a big pouch she carried with her at all times. She said, that this was so nobody could steal these important documents from her. She said she no longer had a car, that they had poured gas on it, that it had been sent and put on flames. Oh, the stories that she told that they even had invented a machine that could fake her handwriting and was forgery. This went on and on, and it got worse and worse. Well, in the 1950s, things went really downhill. At this point, the house, the house burned down the one on West Mountain. Oh, there was nothing left if there had been paintings and artwork and photography and cameras. We don't even really know. Oh, it was so bad. And also when the man came from the fire department to investigate what had happened, he said it was a defective furnace. She said, no, it was not a defective furnace. She had called the furnace man to fix it, that they had kidnapped the furnace man, that they had then set fire to the house. Well, she had no place to live at that point. She went to live in Stonehenge. And later she became inhabitant of that little cottage on Barrack Hill Road. And it's then when she began to feed the cats and people would drop them off at her house. And the population grew to over 100 or more. Well. Things got worse. The IRS said, we have had enough. We cannot let this go on. You have not paid taxes. You call yourself the art heiress. Where is all of the back taxes that you owe me? And what they did, they called a trial in New York City. And what did Jacqueline do? She put an ad in the New York Times and she said, the IRS, the government, my family, all of these people who are so against me and out to get me have called a trial. I want you all there. 
I want you there to support me. I will be my own lawyer. There is nobody in this whole world, now that Edme is gone, that I can possibly trust. I need you to come and support me. She said, you will know me because I have no front teeth. You will know me because I have a broken left shoulder. How did I get this? People have knocked me down. They have knocked out my teeth. They have broken my shoulder. They have traumatized me. Please come. Three people came to the trial. They were reporters. No one else really showed. Well, we don't know really what happened after the trial, but somehow the court case with the IRS was solved. We don't know whether the land that was on Old West Mountain Road was given to them and Jacqueline went to Barrick Hill. We don't know if she had paintings and artwork from her family stored someplace and given to them. We really don't know what happened after that. It was a very, very sad story. She lived in this little cottage on Barrick Hill to her death. The house deteriorated. There were more and more cats. People saw her as more and more paranoid and crazy. People were very interested in her and really didn't learn about her until in the 70s she died in her mid-70s and the obituary came out. And it talked about Jacqueline Sullivan, the very wealthy woman of the famous Paris art critic. You know, it's such a very sad story. In some ways, it reminds us of the hermit, Sarah Bishop of Oscalita Road area. Both of them had so much potential in the beginning. But something somewhere along the line had gone wrong and their lives were devastated with mental issues of different types. <laughs>